Now, on the matter of Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith wrote his book on the meaning of grace, but of course the Bible has a definition from grace that's different from his. And grace is unmerited favor. God is the grantor of grace toward us. But Chuck Smith says we have to be the, the, uh, the one who is faithful toward him in order to get the grace of God. But Paul, author Paul says if it's not by grace, if it's by works, it's not by grace. Otherwise, grace would not be grace. And uh, so I don't know how he gets the word grace in, involved in the midst of being faithful. Otherwise, we didn't get truly saved in the first place. But here we go. Going back to Lordship Salvation. Looking at the rest of Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, founder of Cal Calvary Chapel. The rest of his book, <laughs> looking at it. And some key questions in reviewing it. Lordship Salvation by Chuck Smith. He left. Oops. Press the wrong button. Control F. Our faith must necessarily. Our faith must necessarily lead to a life of obedience and right actions, but it is not those right actions or our obedience that earn us right standing before God. Well, how can it be? One then is completely separate, mutually exclusive from the other. Our faith must necessarily lead to a life of obedience and right actions. If it doesn't, does our faith require right actions? No, it's a mental ascent. But it is not those right actions or our obedience that earns us right standing before God. So if we have a right standing before God by faith alone, he hints at that, then why do we need to do actions to get that right standing? But if, then he says, if there is no fruit in my life, then the relationship must be questioned or even challenged. Not by God, not by his word, but by your own understanding of it, which you've uh, editorialized the Bible to, to include grace and works together. That's what I say here. Since one's assurance comes solely on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary, 1 John 5, 9 through 13, then lack of fruit to whatever degree, no one produces fruit 24-7, is not ever the issue, is it? According to Scripture, no one can claim to lead a life of continual obedience to God's standards. Chuck Smith said so. Thus, according to Chuck Smith's unbiblical theology, no one can be saved. But thank God for the grace of God and what Scripture clearly teaches. That's how you prove out your salvation. By not editorializing Scripture, but studying it, showing yourself approved by studying it, and then reflecting upon it, and then accurately relaying it to other people. 1 John 5, 9 through 13, I look to all the time. I have to remember, well, at age 17, I believe Jesus died for my sins, according to John 3, 16. And I know I have salvation because I did that. Since the Bible has, I've so far not found any errors or contradictions within my limited capacity for 30 years, I trust it until something better comes along. I trust it explicitly, actually. Whenever I have a problem with it, I dig in a little deeper and find that my error was in my interpretation. So, Chuck Smith goes on. That is why Paul tells us, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Well, 2 Corinthians 13.5, he quotes. Well, I say, to determine that 2 Corinthians 13.5 is a proof text as to whether or not one is saved, that you proved out your salvation to yourself or others, is to rip the passage out of its context. In the first edition of this book, there was no distinction in the letter, Paul's letter to the second, uh, second letter of the Corinthians, and uh, no discussion of 2 Corinthians 13.5. This proved to be a significant oversight. Critics of the book sometimes spoke as though the oversight was due to a reluctance on the author's part to confront this text. But this was not the case. But we did misjudge the role of this verse would play in the debate that followed publication of the first edition. 
The inclusion of 2 Corinthians 13.5 is this second in this second edition, edition is therefore absolutely necessary. In 2 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul is announcing his intention to visit the Corinthian church once more. And he writes, I have told you before, and foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before, and to all the rest, that I, if I come again, I will not spare, since you seek a proof of Christ in speaking to me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though, you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. But do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 13, 2-6. Emphasis added. Just as with most of the verses already discussed in this chapter, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 is often ripped out of its context. Failure to consider the context is almost always a formula for misunderstanding and doctrinal confusion. The situation at Corinth was somewhat different from what we, which existed when 1 Corinthians were written, the first book that Epistle of Paul wrote. Although the church as a whole still had warm regard for Paul, 2 Corinthians 7, 6 to 16, Paul now had critics and enemies in Corinth. The believers there had listened to these people more than they should have. Apparently, some of Paul's own converts wondered whether Paul could furnish proof of Christ speaking in him. Paul is now insisting that he will indeed visit, revisit Corinth, though a previously planned trip had been canceled. Furthermore, he insists that when he comes to his conduct, when he comes, his conduct toward them will be marked by the power of God. The tone of 2 Corinthians 13, 2-4 is humble and confident. Paul passes not to spare those Christians among them who had sinned and remained unrepentant. This implies that Paul will either lead the church to discipline these people or that he himself, through prayer, will deliver them to Satan, who will be an instrument for their chastisement. As we know in the previous chapter, this is what Paul did at a later time with Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul knows, of course, his own weakness, yet he has total confidence that his actions at Corinth will be effective toward because of them, because God's power will work through them, through him. The sinning believers will be dealt with in such a way that the Corinthians will get a proof of Christ speaking in me. In short, Paul says, we will live with him, Christ, by the power of God toward you. So Paul's challenge to the Corinthians, yet Paul is not so arrogant as to suggest that such confidence was a special privilege belonging to him alone. True, he knew perfectly well that Christ lived dynamically in him and used him, especially all the miracles and the spiritual gifts that he exemplified. But could not the Corinthians have the same confidence about themselves? Of course they could, provided, of course, that their lives did not stand under God's disapproving censure. So Paul writes, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Unfortunately, these forceful words are often read as though they challenge the Corinthians to find out whether or not they were saved. This is unthinkable and absurd. After 12 chapters in which the, the Apostle tells his readers Christianity for granted, the Apostle takes his readers' Christian, Christianity or faithfulness uh, as, as believers for granted. Can he only now be telling them to make sure they are born again? The question answers itself. It is impossible to read the first 12 chapters of 2 Corinthians carefully without seeing how frequently the Apostle expresses confidence that his readership is truly Christian. Let us notice a few places where this is true. <clears throat> Paul, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. That's 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. And the next passage part. Now I trust you will understand to the end that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of Jesus Christ. Next, he who, now he who establishes you, us, is with you in Christ. As Paul says also, and you are a, our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, 
but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Do not be unequally yoked, unequally yoked together with unbelievers, Paul says. And the Corinthians are established as believers. So Paul has established this. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Or what part of what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. So he's making a declaration here. And then he's not going to turn around and say, now test to see if you're a believer. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. And Paul goes on to say, it is needless to extend this list further. This is uh, Zane Hodges' book on problem passages in the Bible. It is needless, he says, Zane Hodges, to extend this list further. How can anyone read 2 Corinthians and conclude that Paul thought his readership needed to find out whether they were really saved or not? To draw this conclusion from 2 Corinthians 13.5 is to impose on that verse an alien theology about which Paul knew nothing at all. No, indeed. Paul is not saying, examine yourselves to see whether you are born again or justified. But he is saying, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. And this is a different matter, the meaning of in the faith. It is tragic how often a text like this can be read with preconceived notions about the meanings of certain words or phrases. Why should anyone assume that the expression in the faith equals to be a Christian? On what grounds is such an assumption based? What about the same phrase in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, which we read, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Or equally, what about this phrase in Titus 1, 13? Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may sound, be sound, healthy in the faith. There are other passages where an equivalent expression appears. These two are helpful. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Receive one who is weak in the faith. As you therefore have Christ Jesus, receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. Be sober and be diligent, be vigilant, Vigilant, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him and steadfast in the truth, or in the faith. In all the passages we just mentioned, the phrase in the faith relates in some way to our Christian walk or warfare. The meaning to be a Christian is not relevant in any New Testament passage at all. We must conclude that the expression in the faith refers instead to the proper sphere of our spiritual activity. It is, in the, it is the sphere which we are to remain, stand fast, stand, resist the devil, and be spiritually healthy. And it is this type of meaning alone that fits the context of 2 Corinthians 13.5. Paul is quite sure that he himself is in the faith in the sense that he is dynamically related to Christ. Christ speaks to him. God's power works through him. He is confident this will be evident when he returns to Corinth. But the Corinthians can see this in themselves too, if they were will but examine their experience they can see jesus christ living dynamically in themselves as well thus the statement do you not know yourselves that jesus christ is in you has no more to do with the question of salvation than to do the words in the faith what paul has described in his own experience shows that he is thinking of jesus christ being in himself or in the corinthians in a dynamic active and vital sense in the language of the Apostle John, this could be expressed in terms of the abiding life, where the disciple is in Christ and Christ is in the disciple in a dynamic, fruit-bearing relationship. So Paul is saying, take a look at yourselves, test yourselves. Now, you know you're a believer because, again, 1 John 5, 9 through 13 says you believe. You recall that you believe, so you're a believer. Now you see, uh, is your life lining up with what Scripture says? Can you not see Jesus Christ actively living in you, just as I can see him in me? Of course you can unless however you are disqualified okay what is the meaning disqualified the word disqualified is a significant one for paul he used it in his first letter to the corinthian church when he wrote but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified in this passage the apostle has been talking about the christian life as a race he is careful to pursue god's approval in that race so that he will not be disqualified from winning, winning the proper reward. But the Greek word translated disqualified basically means disapproved. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul is telling the Christian readers that as long as they have God's approval on their lives, that is, as long as they are obedient to him, 